medical fellow here at uh, NINDS uh, with a special interest in neuroinfectious diseases. And uh, fortunate to be able to learn from uh, these leading experts in the field on a daily basis. And in this unique era of uh, increased interest in neuroinfectious diseases and the accessible online learning opportunities. So we felt that this could be a good idea to create a structured platform for these experts to share their knowledge. Uh, so we created this first time NINDS hosted the educational lecture series. And I want to give special thanks to uh, Katie Finel, Warren Brown, and Nicole Lamari from the Office of NINDS Clinical Director who have made this uh, possible. All the lectures will be recorded and made available later on the NINDS YouTube channel. And if you have any comments or questions, please contact me or uh, the other members of the team. And uh, with great pleasure, I present today's speaker, Dr. Nath, uh, the clinical director of the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, the chief of the section of infections of the nervous system, uh, previously the director of the division of neuroimmunology and neurological infections at Johns Hopkins. Um, he did uh, his neurology residency in Houston where he also completed a neurovirology, neuroimmunology fellowship, and later a fellowship program in molecular virology here at the NIH. He uh, combines basic and clinical research to study neuropathogenesis of infections, focusing on HIV and endogenous ret retroviruses. He has published numerous papers and books on the topic and received multiple awards. And on a personal note, I can certainly say he's the best uh, mentor you could ask for both personally and professionally. So Dr. Nath, thank you for opening this lecture series and looking forward to hearing your talk. Yeah, thanks Yai for the very nice introduction. Um, so I have to say that, I, uh, that you've done a remarkable job putting this together. Um, and Yai is very passionate about uh, education and he is, um, put a lot of effort into putting these, um, uh, uh, these talks and, uh, and trying to put the whole program together. So I'm looking forward to all these presentations. So Yair asked me to talk about neurotrophism of uh, viruses. And so what I thought I'll, I selected a few that I'll talk about, but um, yeah, presented in the context of neurotrophism. So let me just see if I can share my slides here. Okay. <clears throat> Just a second. Let me just go here. Let me just close a few of these. see it here. Not too many windows open, I think. one more time. Okay. 
Got it. Sorry about that. Took me a bit to figure this out. Okay. So are you able to see my screen now? Yes, we can. Oh, okay. All right. So um, let's just move in. So I'd like to start with this slide here. Um, and this is a quote that I took from uh, a um, talk that Sir William Osler gave in 1896. So he was addressing the American um, Medical Association and he was giving the keynote lecture in the Carolinas. And at which time he said that um, humanity has but three great enemies, fever, famine, and war. Of these by far the greatest and by far the most terrible is fever. And that holds up true today because as you can see that in today's pandemic, um, it's really the infections that have really taken over the world and all the other types of um, catastrophes that happen can never uh, compete with the infections that can wipe out huge populations in short periods of time. Um, but the unfortunate thing is that um, uh, we've had lots of warnings of these pandemics in the past years. One uh, at the time when Ebola was raging in uh, uh, West Africa. And uh, the cover of time says that we are not prepared for the next pandemic. And that's so true because we are in the midst of a pandemic and we found ourselves totally unprepared. And now there is uh, just a few days ago, um, the Washington Post had a whole article on this as the WHO warns that COVID-19 pandemic is not necessarily the big one. So they could be even worse pandemics and uh, uh, the horizon and, um, and we are probably still unprepared. Uh, so it's uh, understanding these infections, uh, their biology, uh, how they spread, how to control them, how to treat them is absolutely critical. And I hope these lecture series will at least uh, advance our knowledge related to the um, uh, ones that affect the central nervous system. Okay, so I wanted to start off by describing these three terms, and that is neuroinvasive, neurotrophic, and neurovirulent. And what do they, these terms actually mean? So the word neuroinvasive means that the um, organism is capable of entering the nervous system. So it just enters there, it may or may not do anything. Okay. Uh, then neurotrophic means that it enters, but not just it enters, it actually infects some of the cells within the central nervous system. And then lastly, you have neurovirulent, which means that it gets into the central nervous system and now it can actually cause disease. So it's important to draw these distinctions because uh, different types of pathogens can fall into each of these categories. Then another set of terms that I'll be using in my presentation is one is called persistent infection and the other is productive infection. So productive infection is simple. It just means that there's active viral replication taking place. A persistent infection means that the virus is not cleared from the host and remains associated with specific cells. And a persistent infection can be of two types. One is latent infection, whereby there is no demonstrable infectious virus that's being produced. Okay. And sometimes during latency, some viral proteins can be produced, but infectious virus is not. And then you have chronic infection where you have low levels of, uh, of the virus being produced, uh, either um, cyclically or, uh, or, or um, um, periodically. And uh, so this is, um, it forms a chronic infection that way. So the next question is, why do viruses infect the brain? Okay, so uh, one hypothesis that's accidental, really the virus doesn't want to infect the brain, it's infecting other organ systems and uh, accidentally it gets to the brain. And so there are people who subscribe to that hypothesis uh, I do not. I think that uh, this is a planned and purposeful mechanism and the brain has uh, long lasting terminally differentiated cells. Uh, so it is a really good place for the virus to hide because you know the neurons don't divide, astrocytes divide, but not very well. So there's a good opportunity for the virus to get there and stay there for extended periods of time. And um, a number of people have written about the possibility that uh, it also helps it spread because it can alter the behavior of the animal 
And the classical example, of course, is rabies, where the animal becomes, uh, after infection, their biting behavior increases. And the same has been shown of mosquitoes as well, uh, that uh, their biting behavior changes uh, to aid the spread of the virus. Okay, so for a virus to persist, certain things have to take place. And the environment uh, within the brain may not be uh, best suitable to the virus when it first gets there. So it has to adapt to brain cells and then it has to transmit within the brain. And so there are different types of cell types there. So it has to acquire new uh, features in order to do so. And it needs to learn how to evade the immune system because otherwise the immune system will just get rid of it and won't be able to establish that. So the virus uh, does a number of uh, interesting things in order to uh, evade it. And then different viruses infect different cell types. And depending on um, where they, uh, what type of cell types they infect, the clinical manifestations will also be different. So for example, cells that infect endothelial cells, which is a number of the arboviruses infect endothelial cells. Uh, they will present with strokes and hemorrhages. So either the blood vessel gets occluded or uh, it will disrupt. Um, if it infects oligodendrocytes like JC virus does in context of PML, it will cause demyelination. Um, and if it infects neurons, it can cause dementia and seizures. Right? Then the anatomical site that is um, preferred by the virus can also make a big difference in the presentation. And lastly, the type of immune response generated can also affect the clinical phenotype. So for example, if it's an antibody mediated encephalitis, so um, for example, herpes viruses can do that, and herpes simplex, I mean, and you can get an NMDA receptor encephalitis. You can get a T cell mediated encephalitis, for example, with immune reconstitution syndrome in the context of PML. Or you can get a macrophage mediated encephalitis, which is in, with HIV infection. Okay, so here are a number of viruses and I'll try to go over them um, within the next few minutes. So I wanna start with HIV because this is a virus that we've done a lot of work on and it has some very interesting features that uh, teach you some fundamental aspects about virology. So the first thing is that despite all the antiretroviral drugs that we give these patients, we don't actually control the virus completely. The viral and products are still being formed. And you can see that um, uh, there's some mild cognitive impairment that still takes place. And it depends on what the Nadir CD4 cell count was. If the patient at some point in time had a very low CD4 cell count, that means that they have an opportunity to establish a very large viral reservoir. And uh, so if they have large viral reservoirs, the uh, incidence of uh, HIV-associated neurocognitive disorders is also greater. And just putting more anti-HIV drugs doesn't control it because uh, once the, um, the reservoir is established, it can continue to produce viral uh, proteins uh, that can impact the pathophysiology of the disease. And as shown here, you can see that um, uh, and those individuals who are on long-term antiretroviral therapy have a different set of neurocognitive abnormalities. So they can have increased difficulty with learning and with executive function, while some of the other features uh, do improve. And this is a nice study showing that uh, individuals who have neurocognitive dysfunction uh, are at a greater chance of, um, of dying uh, compared to those that do not. And so even if they're well controlled, it does have implications because patients who are cognitively impaired, they may not remember to take their pills, they may not be able to, you know, they be more prone to accidents, all kinds of things uh, can happen to these individuals. And here, just to show you that uh, with HIV, you have um, um, predominant involvement of the frontal lobes, and the basal ganglia, while the posterior parts of the brain are usually spared, and patients present with either cognitive difficulties, motor dysfunction, or behavioral changes. So they can occur all simultaneously in this single individual. However, when you look at the pathology of the brain, and this was what was extremely uh, surprising to uh, the scientific community, 
And that was, we expected that if these patients are getting demented, we'll find virus in the, in the neurons. Okay. So you can see here that uh, this is the normal dentate gyrus. This is a patient with no encephalitis, with HIV encephalitis, and then drug abuse. You see paucity of staining right here. And if you look at the neurons themselves, you can see this is what the normal uh, neural pill should look like. Um, on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, you can see the patient with HIV dementia. There's a lot of loss of neurons, but there's no virus in there. That came to us as a surprise because we always thought that, you know, in the polio and rabies, these kinds of viruses, they infect neurons and neurons die uh, from it. But here it's showing you that there are indirect mechanisms by which you can cause a lot of neural destruction. Okay. So you can have neurovirulence without really uh, trophism of the neurons themselves. So where does the virus reside? The virus resides in macrophages. And um, so it can form a productive infection here. And when it infects the macrophages, it forms these multinucleated giant cells. Okay, so you have a number of nuclei here. This is immunostating for GP120. And a lot of them are perivascular here. So the virus is coming from the blood, infecting these macrophages. So which is different because in the periphery, you monitor CD4 cell count. So it's, it has to change its trophism to survive in the brain, right? So it has to go from a lymphocyte trophism to a macrophage trophism. And similarly here in the perivascular cells, you can show that there's a lot of TAT expression as well. And this is the microglial nodule with some extracellular TAT also. Okay, the second cell type that gets infected is the astrocyte. And that is very interesting because um, it's not a, it uses a very unique mechanism of infection. So it's not that the virus just freely enters the cell. The virus has to be presented by the lymphocyte and the lymphocyte has to have cell-to-cell -cell contact with the astrocyte. So you can see there's an astrocyte here at the bottom and all these round little things are all lymphocytes sticking to these astrocytes. And under scanning EM, and this was done by Sriram Subramaniam when he was in, at NCI. And what he showed is this beautiful astrocyte here and uh, this lymphocyte right on top. And, um, and you can see all these processes coming out. And if you look at this one very more closely, you can see that this astrocyte has put out this process that's just wrapping around the lymphocyte. But at this area of junction between these two cells, if you look at it carefully, and this is really nice, all these red dots are viral particles here. So you can see a lot of viral particles here. And again, he shows that here. So all these viral particles are being released only at the junction of these two cells. Right? They're not being released here freely. They're just released right at the area of contact. And under transmission EM, if you were to look at it, what you will find is that uh, there are these viral synapses that form. Okay? And on these, in these viral synapses, you have viral particles that are not completely released from the T cell, but are in contact with the astrocyte membrane. And that is absolutely critical for viral transmission to occur because the envelope has to be in an open state in order to bind to CXCR4 over here because the astrocyte lacks CD4. So the virus has developed unique ways of being able to infect cells within the brain. And, um, and this is uh, elegant work again done from Chris Powers lab where he showed that if you look at the um, viral diversity, you'll find that um, uh, it is most diverse in patients who have HIV dementia. So HAD means HIV associated dementia. And this is a consensus sequence right in the middle and the longer the line is the most diverse it is. And they seem to cluster together as compared to individuals who do not have dementia. So it tells you that um, the uh, viral sequences are, are also different and it's adapted to the brain. And then this is work uh, coming from our lab, uh, whereby we looked at spinal fluid of these HIV patients and found that uh, these individuals are on uh, antiretroviral therapy, some of them for as long as 10 to 15 years with uh, no viral replication. Uh, however, we had no difficulty measuring TAT protein in their spinal fluid. So about a third of these patients are still producing a lot of TAT protein. And here at autopsy, you can see these macrophages uh, that are producing TAT protein, while well, you cannot find any of the other structural proteins there. So the uh, antiretroviral drugs cannot uh, prevent the formation of um, RNA and proteins from 
the proviral DNA, what it can do is prevent uh, production of infectious viral particles. Okay, so the take home messages are that HIV can infect the entire nerve axis. I showed you about the brain, but uh, the spinal cord and nerves are also affected. Um, and in the CNS, HIV infects the macrophages and astrocytes, but the cells that are undergoing degeneration are actually neurons. And so all the viral products being produced by these are the ones that are affecting the neurons. Antiretroviral drugs can decrease the severity of the manifestations, but they don't eliminate them. Okay, uh, so this is a slide I borrowed from an um, article written by Don Gilden, and he lists all the herpes viruses here. And he shows that uh, if you look at immune competent hosts versus immune suppressed hosts, you will find a totally different type of manifestation. And I think that's a very interesting observation because it clearly shows that how the immune system can alter the clinical manifestations uh, with each of these viruses. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about CMV encephalitis. And so it produces a very interesting classical syndrome. So if you look at uh, the retina over here, you'll see that uh, there are hemorrhages and there are infarcts in the retina and, so, and there are necrotic lesions in the retina. Um, and in fact, only two viruses will do that. That is the CMV and VZE. So if you look at the retina, you can pretty much make the diagnosis. Um, but the other thing it does is it also affects the uh, periventricular area, particularly the ependema. Okay. So, uh, and th that thing I think is absolutely important because, um, uh, and here on another, this one I've taken from the literature and uh, they describe these owl's eyes phenomenon, which is nothing else but inflammation uh, around the ependema. And it likes to infect these ependymal cells, the circulates in the spinal fluid, and then we'll attack these cells here. Um, and then you can see these inclusion bodies uh, in these um, macrophages here. And so it also infects the macrophages and they'll produce these huge, uh, large, fully blown up uh, macrophages here. Okay. That's why it's called cytomegalo inclusion virus. So it's, uh, the megalo comes from these big cells. Okay. And here's yet another patient where you can see, again, changes in the ependema. Uh, and, um, uh, and then with treatment, uh, this is pre-treatment, and then with treatment, it actually disappears. So you can see that uh, gancyclovir can make a difference in treatment and, uh, and control the virus. So, but the other thing it does is it can cause uh, developmental abnormalities in children and cause a congenital uh, CMV syndrome because it can cross across the placenta. And I'm going to talk about that phenomenon again in relationship with Zika virus. It does somewhat similar things. But once it enters the, um, uh, the fetal brain, the important thing is that here's in the spinal fluid here, and then it's infecting the ependymal cells, as I mentioned earlier. And it can also infect the radial glial cells. But by doing so, it now prevents the brain from forming because uh, these progenitor cells here are critical in uh, migrating to the rest of the brain and forming the various layers of the brain. So if you prevent that from happening, you're gonna get congenital deformities uh, within the brain. And so you get impairment of neurogenesis and microcephaly. Then I want to say a few things about the arboviruses. So there are lots of arboviruses um, and largely spread by mosquitoes and by ticks. Um, and uh, I'm not going to go all over all of them, but uh, I'm going to pick a few just to illustrate the point of uh, neurotrophism. So, so here's a question for you. So which arbovirus has been weaponized? Okay. And uh, so this is uh, from CNN News uh, now many years ago, but it said that the uh, three vials of virus were missing from a Maryland facility. Okay, this is at Fort Detrick. And the thing is that um, and these neurotropic viruses have been weaponized. Uh, 
And here's a whole book on uh, chemical and biological warfare. Um, now it turns out that they eventually found these vials and they were stuck in some freezer uh, and weren't properly cataloged. So no harm was ever done. But you can see that uh, it raises a huge amount of scare because um, people are very worried that these viruses can spread easily and you could cause a lot of destruction and havoc. And so what it is, is Venezuelan uh, equine encephalitis uh, virus, and that has been weaponized. Why they chose that one to weaponize, I don't really know, but that seems to be the case. Um, another uh, arbovirus is uh, Japanese encephalitis, which is a close cousin of uh, West Nile encephalitis virus. And uh, this is a leading cause of encephalitis in Asia. Uh, you have, um, uh, you know, 50 to 70,000 cases reported annually. Um, and the case fatality rate is about 20 to 30 percent. So we estimate about 15,000 deaths per year. Uh, and the ones that survive, uh, you have significant neurological sequelae. So, I mean, this is still a bad infection. And although compared to COVID now, it appears uh, anemic uh, in that sense. Um, but it still is a, is a huge yeah, problem. And this is the area that's really affected uh, here in yellow. Um, and then West Nile, which is very close to it, uh, is, uh, was isolated first in Uganda. And, at that, uh, and then historically, it uh, had some infrequent um, outbreaks, uh, but it was only when it came to the United States that we saw um, quite um, large devastations uh, starting from New York and spreading across uh, the continent. And so you can see it came here in New York in 1999. Uh, it's thought that it came on ships um, um, and because there's water on the ships and um, and then it, um, and mosquitoes could easily um, survive there. And then it gradually spread all across the United States um, so in 2002. And by 2017, it was all over the place. Okay, with all these uh, viruses, Japanese B encephalitis and Japanese encephalitis and with the West Nile, um, most of the patients are asymptomatic. Okay, so the CNS disease is a small proportion, but yet this is the most scariest of all the things um, because uh, these patients have long-term sequelae and they can die and they usually die from CNS disease. So the clinical manifestations, um, you can see here uh, is somewhat related to the fact that basal ganglia seem to be vulnerable to these infections. And I must say the same thing, a lot of viruses go to the basal ganglia. HIV also likes to go to the basal ganglia. And it's not entirely clear why that is the case. It's one possibility is it has to relate it to the blood flow uh, to this area. You got lots of small, small blood vessels and uh, going here and maybe they take uh, with them. Uh, and then here you can see there's um, uh, a high signal intensity lesion here in the substantia nigra. And these patients do develop movement disorders um, quite often. It can also affect the uh, spinal cord. And so you can get a myelitis, but it affects the anterior part of the spinal cord most often. So you get a polio myelitis type picture, uh, this affecting only the motor system. Okay, so here's another arbovirus. Um, and uh, so I'm going to present to you the history of this patient and see uh, what you think. So uh, this is a 62-year-old man from New York, and uh, he was often outdoors, wooded areas, uh, developed a fever, 104 degrees, and then develops a maculopapular rash, uh, has diplopia, dysarthria, right-sided weakness for four days. Okay. And he looked at the spinal fluid, and there are lots of lymphocytes there and elevated protein. And this is what his MRI looks like. And you can see that uh, these arrows are showing there's a lesion here in the cerebellum. You can see it here in the basal ganglia. And um, so the question is, what could this patient have? And the thing is, it could have any of uh, the multiple arboviruses. Um, uh, you know, could be bitten by mosquitoes, and most of them will produce a similar kind of a picture. It would be hard to differentiate, although the rash 
may be um, may or may not be present not with all of them so in this case it turned out to be Powassan encephalitis and Powassan encephalitis uh, is increasing in uh, incidents uh, and traveling along the uh, east coast uh, from Massachusetts all the way down to Virginia and uh, so this patient came uh, to autopsy and what they found was that uh, this is a neurotrophic virus you can see it's here in the Purkinje cells of the cerebellum uh, you can see that nice and staining here um, you can even see it in these uh, neural processes coming off of these Purkinje cells, the large neural process here. And then you can find it in, um, uh, in the pyramidal neurons in the hippocampus, you can see here. Uh, it's also staining for viral antigen. Uh, you can see it here in neurons in the temporal lobe, um, and then here in the pons as well. And then there's some oligodendrocytes that might also be positive. So it is a neurotrophic virus, it's infecting neurons, and also some uh, oligodendrocytes. And so, as I said, this is a Powassan encephalitis and um, what we see largely here is uh, lineage one. Uh, sorry, lineage, uh, yeah. Then moving on to another uh, virus, which is Eastern equine encephalitis. Uh, so this, um, every year in the summertime, uh, it uh, uh, infects areas, uh, again, um, predominantly in the east. And um, uh, again, this year uh, was uh, endemic in Massachusetts, um, um, but uh, it's um, spread through mosquitoes. Uh, we don't get a lot of cases, but anyways, about 30 some cases uh, every year or so, but it's gradually increasing in incidence. Um, it, um, again, uh, you know, it has viral reservoirs in, during the winter and then, uh, and likely in birds, and then the mosquitoes get it from birds and then they spread it to humans. So the key points about Eastern equine encephalitis is the incubation period is only about two weeks of all the viruses, it is the most destructive, okay? The spinal cord is usually spared and it affects more children uh, than adults. And um, those people on B cell therapies are really at greater risk. Um, it is an RNA virus, so it has a very high mutation rate because there's no proofreading of the RNA. As I said, it's spread by mosquitoes. And uh, here's an MRI of uh, one of these patients and they call this uh, the parentheses sign because again, as it involves the outer part of the basal ganglia here, you can see uh, a high signal intensity lesion. And the uh, tropism is, is interesting. You can see uh, microglial nodules here uh, in these patients. A uh, lot of macrophages that are just chewing up all these neurons here. The neurons are the ones that are infected, and but uh, the uh, macrophages um, uh, come in and try to get rid of these infected cells. And here's destruction in the uh, substantia nigra. Okay, so the next I'm going to move on to uh, Zika virus. And I uh, had an opportunity to uh, visit the Zika forest. And one thing I noticed was that it's spelled with two eyes instead of one. Uh, and, but there's very little bit left of the forest any longer. Most of it has been torn down now and there's a housing development here. Um, but uh, what it does do is it produces this remarkable syndrome of microcephaly. And depending on the gestational age at which the fetus gets in, uh, infected, it can produce uh, anything from this mild changes in the brain to total uh, encephaly, which is no production of the brain at all and everything in between. Um, so, but it can also produce an immune mediated syndrome, which would be Guillain-Barre syndrome or myelitis. And then there's uh, questions about uh, long-term neurocognitive dysfunction in adults because of its ability to infect the progenitor cells in the brain. So this is what happens. It can, again, as I showed you with CMV, can infect the um, uh, epithelial cells here and um, um, 
Uh, however, um, when it infects the neural progenitor cells, it actually uh, destroys them and um, prevents them from differentiating into neurons. So this infection is key for all the uh, neuropathology that you see in these patients. And as I mentioned earlier, that um, and there's immune-mediated syndrome of Guillain-Barre syndrome that is uh, associated with Zika virus. And that's how it was recognized in uh, South America was the increase in incidence of uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome in Brazil. And this is from Colombia work uh, done by Carlos Barlow here. Okay, and um, as I mentioned earlier, Zika virus can cause a lot of congenital uh, abnormalities uh, in the brain and can range from uh, periventricular calcifications, uh, microcephaly, and all kinds of other abnormalities. Uh, as I mentioned that um, it can also cause a meningoencephalitis in adults. Um, so it can enter the CSF pathways and lead to inflammation there. And when it causes a myelitis, it again is an anterior myelitis, so it affects the anterior horn cells. And, uh, and this is the, uh, uh, in the Zika forest, uh, this guy, Alex Haddo, had put together this uh, contraption here and uh, the scaffold, he would put these little cages here with various kinds of animals and then uh, collect their blood. And what he found was that, uh, and he would isolate viruses, and he found that these mosquitoes have different biting behaviors. And if they, and they travel at different distances um, from the bottom. So if they like to feed on birds, you'll find a different species of mosquitoes right on top. If they like to feed on uh, you know, rats or whatever, then they could be right at the bottom over here and everything in between. You know? And that was him here. And he had isolated Zika virus uh, quite early on in 1948, um, but um, you know, just cataloged it and then people forgot about it. And only later did we realize that, okay, this is a important pathogen. Okay, moving on to another set of viruses. Let's talk a little bit about Ebola. And so um, uh, Ebola devastated uh, Western Africa, as you know, um, and uh, again, um, um, this is spread by bats. And so it is, and it's a very different virus. It's a phylovirus, it has nothing to do with the coronaviruses. Okay, they're very different viruses. And, but uh, interestingly, the way bats get infected, it's thought that the actual reservoir are pythons. And um, the pythons try to follow the bats. And uh, in doing so, the bat gets infected. If the bat gets released by the python, now the bat will spread it amongst its colony. And then from bats, it will travel to humans. And so the, uh, the Ebola virus grows best at lower temperatures. And the pythons, uh, their temperature is much lower uh, than our temperature. I think it's about 28 degrees or something as opposed to 37. And so it grows really well at those temperatures. Uh, but yet it's extremely pathogenic in humans. So we saw a patient here at NIH uh, who had uh, meningoencephalitis. And so uh, with cerebral, cerebral bleeds and infarcts is an important sequelae of these uh, patients. And so you can see here on the MRI of this patient, uh, these small punctate white matter lesions. Nobody's ever done an autopsy in uh, Ebola patients. And I think that's another thing we need to think about as a neurological community is uh, same thing with the COVID patient. It was very hard to do autopsies and very few people have actually done them. And so uh, we really need a way of being able to safely do autopsies on patients who may carry infectious organisms. And um, uh, taking out the brain represents particular challenges because you have to open the skull. Um, but um, we've, um, same thing has come to light again in the current pandemic, and we face these problems repeatedly, but we haven't solved them yet. Um, now, this is a tissue that we got from uh, macaques that were infected with Zika virus from Fort Detrick. And uh, what we found here is that the virus, all the brown staining is for the viral antigen, 
it infects endothelial cells. So you can see these blood vessels light up over here really nicely. And then we also found some neurons that were positive uh, for one of the viral antigens, but not all of them, suggesting that some kind of restricted viral replication takes place in neurons, but the productive viral replication probably occurs in endothelial cells. Mm -hmm. So uh, that again, that different type of uh, viral replication cycles uh, with these viruses within the brain, depending on which cell types they infect, is also very important to the neuropathogenesis of the virus and establishment of viral reservoirs. Because those viruses that are able to form restricted viral replications will stay there for extended periods of time. And then periodically they will produce uh, infectious virus and release it. Okay, so uh, here is another case uh, that I want to illustrate. And this is a 32-year-old pig farmer in Malaysia. And this individual had headache and fever for three days, a generalized seizure, a decreased level of consciousness, and, uh, and then developed some brainstem signs here. Uh, eventually developed tachycardia and hypertension, which is probably also related to the brainstem involvement. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Um, So this is a, a Nipah virus is what this person was infected with. And it was transmitted by pigs. Mm. Uh, so, um, uh, and the number of viruses that can be transmitted by pigs, we know a lot about influenza virus, hepatitis E is also transmitted this way. And, uh, and so is Nipah. Um, and uh, so Nipah can infect bats, it can infect, um, uh, pigs, and then from either of them, it can infect humans. But it is uh, just as pathogenic as uh, Ebola, maybe even more so. So mortality rates are extremely high, uh, close to 90% or so. The, uh, uh, and then this is an MRI of that one patient I showed you here. And so you can see this massive involvement of the brain, all the basal ganglia, the cortical uh, a ribbon over here and subcortical areas over here, all involved on both sides. So, um, and uh, this is uh, an interesting outbreak that occurred a couple of years ago in the uh, uh, southern part of India and in Bangladesh. And um, they attributed it to bats, but this is an interesting practice. And they collect the sap of these palm trees, just like you would collect maple syrup out of maple trees, I guess. And, um, uh, but the spigot uh, is there on this earthen pot. So it's exposed to the external environment. And what they do is they collect the sap and then they ferment it and, um, and then um, drink it. But now what is happening is that at nighttime here with an infrared camera, you can see that we have the earthen pot, uh, there is a visitor here, and there's this bat here. And it says, this is easy sap for me. You know, they've already shaved it off. So it's licking the sap, but in addition, it's leaving all the organisms. So the organisms are probably entering this drink. And that's how it was spread in these areas. Uh, but if you look at the flight path of these bats, it's actually huge. I mean, they cover a huge part of the uh, several continents. Okay. So the potential for these bad born diseases to spread and cause new epidemics and pandemics is, uh, is really big. And we just noticed that with coronavirus, now coronavirus was not due to the ability of bats to fly that far, but it was spread from human to human once it became uh, pathogenic in humans. But it has the potential of carrying things uh, long distances. Okay, uh, as I mentioned earlier, brainstem signs are uh, quite common in these patients. Um, and uh, again, nobody's ever done an autopsy on these patients. So the best we have is a ferret model of Nipah virus. And, but what you see is again, infection of endothelial cells and neurons. Okay. So infection of endothelial cells is quite common with a lot of viruses. Um, and uh, that's one way it can enter various organs because if, you had, if the virus has the ability to infect an endothelial cell, then it can enter any organ at once. Um, and if it has the ability to infect neurons in addition, then it can just stay here. Uh, it has infection of the choroid plexus here. And then you can see the subependymal tissue also. 
is uh, infected with the virus. So it infects multiple cell types um, and within the uh, brain. Then the other interesting thing is that there is this late onset uh, Nipah virus. Um, so the, the first infection may be mild, patients don't really realize it. And then they um, have this incubation period or, or period of latency, I guess, that can last several months. Um, and, um, uh, and up to here, as well, close to almost two years when there can be a, a relapse of the virus. And by that time, people don't remember that they were ever exposed to it. So it can be very difficult to diagnose it. Uh, but it's very important to diagnose it because the human to human transmission is huge and, uh, and very easily spread between humans. So you can see here uh, you know, in Nipah epidemic here, 90% mortality and uh, all dressed in uh, all this PPE in order to carry somebody who's uh, died of it because it comes out in the sweat. Every single um, um, body fluid is uh, teeming with virus. So it's very easy to spread. Okay, uh, say a few words about acute flaccid myelitis in children. So this is um, a polio-like illness. And um, it's interesting as to why this is emerging now that we've controlled polio. Um, I'll show you some data suggesting that it is due to an enterovirus. Uh, but, uh, you know, polio is caused by enterovirus. So there are three different serotypes that are associated with polio, but we have very effective vaccines to control them. Uh, uh, there are a lot of other non-pathogenic uh, polio um, enteroviruses there. So, but what nature does is once you control the most pathogenic ones, then the other non-pathogenic ones start moving through the populations and gradually they adapt and become more and more pathogenic. So it's quite possible that uh, new strains of enteroviruses are now emerging um, and getting more and more pathogenic. And this acute flaccid myelitis may be uh, a phenomenon because of that. So you can see in the United States here, um, every two years we seem to have this um, um, resurgence of cases of acute flaccid myelitis. Uh, and we were due to have one this year, but we really did not. And that may be due to the fact that uh, there was all this distancing and isolation and schools were closed. So the ability for the virus to spread amongst children uh, was minimized. But in the off years, there is a reservoir. So what we're worried about is that maybe in this coming year, uh, we may have it's, um, a resurgence of the infection. Uh, so instead of all even years, we might have it in an odd year this year. It remains to be seen. Um, as I mentioned, it's a polio-like illness, so it affects only the anterior uh, part of the spinal cord. And you can see here beautifully, this high signal intensity lesion outlines the anterior uh, horn uh, of the uh, spinal cord here. And this uh, elegant work uh, done by Ian Lipkin and then later by, um, uh, and also by um, uh, uh, Michael Wilson, and they both showed that um, this is um, um, acute facet myelitis is most likely due to uh, an enterovirus called ED, uh, ED D68. And uh, they stereotyped the antibodies and they found that there was uh, a very specific um, uh, peptide here, about a, 20, a 12 more peptide that was found only in this uh, uh, type of um, strain of uh, enterovirus. And these patients had antibodies that were specific to that uh, peptide. Um, but um, enterovirus D68 may be the predominant cause of it, but it's not the only one. Uh, so there are a number of other viruses that can also cause acute flaccid myelitis. Uh, so that confuses the picture a little bit. And the problem is that we can demonstrate the enterovirus infection by antibodies but you try looking for the virus and you cannot find it. Uh, so that is, is difficult. And that is a problem with a number of CNS um, pathogens. They're so cell associated that they don't leak into the spinal fluid. So we think we can diagnose everything by sequencing the spinal fluid. That is not always the case. Um, 
and another patient with acute flaccid myelitis, you can see here involvement of the, uh, uh, of the upper brain stem as well as the spinal cord. Okay, and so uh, we do not have, again, we don't have a pathology from patients with acute flaccid myelitis. The best we have is a very unusual case of an encephalopathy with acute flaccid myelitis. So this individual was immune suppressed and, um, and you can see that uh, within the brain here, um, and you can see a, a lot of pathology here. So the, uh, uh, the neurons are uh, myelin, there's lots of myelin over here. You can see these spheroids over here. And, um, and there's um, a lot of perivascular lesions here as well. Okay, so uh, the last thing I wanna talk about is uh, SSP. And because I think that is a very interesting neurotropic virus. Uh, so this occurs with measles and it can occur several years after the initial infection. And it produces a, um, a subacute um, cognitive abnormalities. And the way you diagnose it again is not by isolating the virus, you can't find the virus, but you have intrathecal synthesis of antibodies. It's a very classical EEG pattern that you'd see on your boards and the spike and wave, uh, periodic spike and uh, wave, uh, sharp waves here. Okay, now if you look for the virus, where you find it is you'll find it in neurons. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so you can see these um, neurons and all these um, little, um, uh, uh, you know, these dots over here in the axon itself uh, shows you that there is uh, a decreased uh, transport here. Uh, and you also find it in some oligodendrocytes here. So the uh, neurons and the oligodendrocytes are infected by the uh, measles virus. But in SSP, it's not a productive infection. That's the very fascinating thing. So in order for the measles virus to survive within the brain, it has to mutate. And so when you look at the viral sequences uh, from the brain, uh, from SSPE patients, you'll find mutations in, the, uh, uh, in two regions. One is the matrix and the other is the F1. So the F1 is this uh, fusion peptide, which is important for cell-to-cell uh, -cell, uh, transmission of the virus. And um, so when we look, uh, when people looked at the um, uh, viral sequences, they found that they were mutations here in the uh, fusion protein. And, but these mutations that they found, what it does is it makes the virus hyperfusogenic. So now it's going to become more efficient in cell-to-cell -cell transmission. And cell-to-cell -cell transmission is key in the brain because uh, that way you can evade the immune system and you can go from one cell to another. And shown here experimentally, they, it took the virus, made it for us and put it in one cell here. And you can see that it's transmitting uh, to another cell over here. And then after a while, you don't see the intervening process. And you, now you see all three cells infected here. So this is the fusion one I, we talked about. And then the other is that there's also mutations that occur in the matrix protein. And uh, this is also key in cell-to-cell uh, -cell transmission because the matrix protein is important for formation of the viral particle. Okay. And uh, what I'm going to show you is that, um, uh, so here's the virus here in the oligodendrocyte and the neuron. And so it's possible that it gets transmitted from one cell to another, but once it gets in the neuron, it goes neuron to neuron. Okay. Uh, and so the way it does that is you form this fusion and you don't get a complete viral particle form because the matrix protein is, um, uh, is mutated, but it will take the RNA and the proteins and then uh, get it across uh, one neuron to the other. And that is very different from uh, the rabies virus and herpes viruses, which they go across the synapse without forming a fusion here. So they are totally different modes of viral transmission. So I'm gonna stop here. I think we've run out of time. I'm not gonna talk about coronaviruses. And that's the whole different topic. And take any questions. Uh, okay.
Thank you, Dr. Um, we have time for maybe uh, one or two questions. You can put it in the chat box or just unmute yourself. Javi, I had a question about your HIV. You said that HIV doesn't infect neurons, but the products from the macrophages uh, kill the neurons or lead to their degeneration. How does that work? Yeah, yeah. So there are multiple different mechanisms. Uh, we looked at this uh, TAT protein and, uh, and we put it on neurons and we found that as soon as you put it on neurons, they start firing like crazy. It causes an excitotoxicity and leading to a neuronal cell death. So that's one way. The other way that it can do it is it can cause glial cell activation. And once you cause glial cell activation, then you can get cytokines that are produced that are toxic and also have increased oxidative stress. So there could be multiple mechanisms uh, that are involved in uh, leading to a neural injury. You know? Yeah, quick question for you. Great lecture. Can you hear me? Um, yes, I can. can you talk a little bit about sterile uh, inflammation of the brain from viral infections? Uh, you mean lack of inflammation in the brain? So PML uh, is one. Um, you know, it, it usually occurs in patients who are immune suppressed. So, and you can get a lot of viral replication taking place in oligodendrocytes and in astrocytes, but yet you won't get any inflammation. In the AIDS population, we saw a lot of it. Um, in the, uh, and you also see in the transplant population, uh, same way. Uh, however, in the, uh, so you can call that a sterile uh, 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 infection if you want to. Um, now there are certain circumstances in which the virus can remain latent in the brain. And, and so it doesn't uh, excite an inflammation uh, either. So herpes viruses do that. Um, they will stay latent in the dorsal root ganglia, for example. Um, or the trigeminal ganglia, and um, uh, and they don't cause any kind of inflammation. So, uh, Bobby, one of the big problems with the virus is, is treatment of the virus infection itself. There seem to be very few antivirals. Yes. Are there any uh, clues or uh, ideas that people might have in terms of what you were talking about in terms of therapy, for example, blocking cell-to-cell uh, -cell transmission? Are there agents that might do something like that? that could, mm -hmm. uh, yes, so that's a very important uh, topic of its own. The thing is that, yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, we have antivirals for HIV and we have antivirals for some of the herpes viruses, but that's pretty much it. Uh, after that, we don't have antivirals for any of these things. Uh, and, um, and it's hard, uh, you know, even for the coronaviruses right now, you don't have an antiviral, um, you know. Um, and so the, um, I mean, one possibility is that you develop these antisense molecules. You know? And so if one could develop a way of being able to deliver those effectively to the brain, and, uh, and now with these liposomes and other things, it may actually be possible. And certainly we've done it well for SMA, uh, you know, spinal muscular atrophy, we could probably do it for these other things too. So that way you can, target them within the cell and prevent them from uh, moving forwards. And if it's an RNA virus, then uh, our, you have these RNA-H activity there and that can then degrade these things. So that's one possibility of making these things quickly. Drug development otherwise takes a very long time. You know? The broad spectrum antivirals is another effort that people are doing. Um, broad, uh, you know, monoclonal antibodies is another way that people think they can uh, control viruses. But in, in the CNS, these things don't work that well. Yeah, this has to be a, a very important breakthrough for the future. There yeah. has to be yeah. better, better treatment for viruses, as you point out. They're so so important and so severe, but, uh, yeah. uh, but the no effect of the other material is very little. Yeah. 
Dr. Neth, is there any evidence that SARS-CoV-2 does in fact infect endothelial cells? Any direct visual evidence by electron microscopy or by immunohistochemistry? Okay. So yeah, there's some published EMs. Uh, there's one from Mount Sinai showing virus in uh, coming out of endothelial cells. There's another group that published one out of lung endothelial cells. So, and you know, the ACE2 is the receptor for the virus and is present on endothelial cells. So yes, there's some evidence for it. Um, we looked ourselves uh, in the brain and we didn't find anything. And we did a lot of immunohistochemistry. We did um, in situ um, hybridization and RNA-seq analysis too. And so at least we didn't find it, but yes, others have reported. So it, it, it can certainly occur. All right, well, thank you very much. Yes, thank you. We can conclude here and see you in two weeks, the next lecture on neuroimaging. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.